You probably haven't noticed, but we're living in a giant experiment. The financial world that we've been living in for the last 50 years is nothing like anything that's happened in history before. Understanding this is really important because it will give you clues as to what the future is going to be like and you can make better financial decisions for yourself as a result. I've been researching this for my book, The Price of Money, which is out right now. We'll put a link in the description, but I'm going to share the main lessons with you right now. The way the global financial system is organised completely transformed one evening in 1971 when the gold standard came to an end. The gold standard was a system where the US dollar was defined as being worth a specific amount of gold, and every other currency was defined as being worth a specific amount of dollars. So every major currency in the world ended up having a link to gold. The system was set up so that any country could take the dollars that they were holding and hand them in and receive gold in return. And this system worked perfectly as long as one thing remained true. The US didn't print a whole load more dollars than they actually had the gold to back up. Unfortunately, they did what every government in history has always done, which is succumb to the temptation of printing money to make their lives easier. Other countries started to cotton on to the fact that they were printing far more dollars than they actually had gold. And basically, a bank run started where countries were handing back all their dollars and expecting gold in return that the US didn't actually have. This wasn't sustainable and the US had to take action. So the president at the time, Richard Nixon, in 1971, temporarily suspended the gold standard. So he's saying the US dollar was worth a fixed amount of gold. Temporarily, it's not. There is nothing backing it whatsoever. That temporarily has now been going on for 51 years. And what it effectively means is that there is no constraint anymore on the amount of money that can be created. Money can be created in limitless quantities, and it's created by two different sources. It's created by central banks, like the Bank of England, but it's also created by everyday high street banks, like the ones you probably have accounts with. It sounds crazy if you're not used to it, but they create money in the form of debt. I go into all this in the book. But the point is that via these two sources, any amount of money can be created. And if you look at this chart, you can see it has been. This chart shows the total amount of money in the UK economy over time. And you can see how particularly since the 1970s, the amount has grown beyond belief. It's absolutely huge. And this has had a couple of different effects. The first effect is that any money that you're holding in cash becomes worth less because of inflation. Inflation is driven by this increase in the amount of money. We've got a separate video called Inflation Explained in 12 Minutes. We'll link to that one below. Make sure you go watch that one because that's worth understanding in itself. But today we'll talk about the second effect, which is the amount of debt in the economy. All this new money that's been created by high street banks, commercial banks, is created in the form of debt. So because the amount of money has increased, the amount of debt has increased as well. You can see this debt showing up in two different places. There's private debt, which is debt held by individuals, households, companies, and there's public debt, which is money owed by the government. If we look at private debt first, you can see from this chart that it's increased from about 60% of GDP in the 70s to over 200% today. That's an absolutely enormous increase in the amount of debt relative to the size of the economy. You can see it in public debt too, the debt that's owed by the government. As you can see, up to the 70s, for the most part, the government was running surpluses. It was bringing in more than it was spending, which is good because then it has a buffer in money it can spend if it needs to, if the economy starts to struggle. From the 70s onwards though, the pattern completely changed. It's run a deficit in every year other than six since 1971. That means that in every one of those years where the government is spending more than it's bringing in, it has to make up the difference by borrowing, by going into debt. And this is really important to understand. We've ended up in a position where the government has an amount of debt that can never be repaid. All that happens is that debt gets rolled on and on and on, and it gets added to by this extra deficit every single year. This is a really important point for understanding what the future is likely to look like, because it means that interest rates cannot meaningfully rise. If interest rates rise, the government needs to pay higher rates of interest on this huge debt that it has and that's growing all the time. If that happens, it's not going to be possible. 
The government also knows that the private sector has got this debt that's gone from 60% of GDP to over 200%. It will not be able to afford higher interest payments. So if interest rates did dramatically increase, you'd see business and personal bankruptcies all over the place. They've ended up trapped in a situation where interest rates have to remain low. Let's move on to talking about something else that's very important for understanding where the economy is going, which is inflation. Inflation will be high over the coming years because the government needs to use it as a tool to reduce the debt relative to the size of the economy. Let's see how that works. So at the moment, the government has a national debt of 2.3 trillion and GDP of 2.2 trillion. That means that debt is 104% of GDP. That's bad. But what if over the course of a year you have 10% inflation, which is not far off what we've actually got right now. As a result of that inflation, GDP goes up from 2.2 trillion to 2.4 trillion. But let's say that the debt has remained the same at 2.3. As a result, the debt to GDP ratio has decreased from 104% to 95%. That's much better. And that's only been over the course of a year. You can see that the longer this goes on for, the more things improve. This is public debt, but the same goes for private debt as well. What it ultimately means is that lenders are getting screwed over because they're getting paid back with pounds that were worth less than the pounds that they loaned in the first place. But because they're getting screwed over slowly, it's kind of okay and they manage to get away with it. Inflation can be painful, but it's far less painful than the alternative, which is having an amount of debt, which is just growing and growing and growing. So that's the second key point to understand. Inflation may not always be as high as it is right now, but it is going to be higher over the next decade than it has been over the last few. Why? Because the government kind of needs it to be. Okay, so what can you take away from this? Well, there's one really critical point to understand, and that is that you might expect that interest rates will be jacked right up to try to bring inflation under control. That's what would have happened in the past, and it happened in the 70s. But the difference is that we've never had this level of debt before. The amount of debt that we have makes it impossible for this to happen, because if interest rates were increased to deal with inflation, it would crash absolutely everything. No one's going to survive. But the main tool that they would normally use to control it, which are interest rates, they kind of can't really use anymore. And as we've seen, not only can they not really do much about it, they also don't particularly want to because they need this inflation to reduce the amount of debt in the system relative to the size of the economy. As a result, over the coming years, we're looking at a situation where we have low interest rates and high inflation. And critically, the level of inflation is going to be higher than interest rates. What does this mean? Well, it means that if you're saving money, you're going to be punished because the amount of interest that you're earning is actually going to be exceeded by the rate at which your money is losing value due to inflation. So you're going to come out worse. On the other hand, if you're borrowing money, you're going to be rewarded because you'll be paying a relatively low amount of interest. And even if you just invest the money in something that just keeps up with inflation and does nothing more, you're still going to come out ahead. This is the opposite of what you'll see talked about in most places because most people don't understand how things are and how we've got to this point. But now we're here, this is the reality. This is what's going to happen. So that gives you some clues about how to set yourself up now to take advantage of what we now know is going to come. But there are lots more specifics about how to invest to take advantage of what you now know. And that is what we're going to be getting into in the next video. So make sure you're subscribed to this channel so you get notified when that comes out. Also, I talk about all of this in my book, The Price of Money, which is out now and you'll find it linked in the description below.